beautiful song. And it, uh, if you weren't here last Wednesday night, you, uh, you really missed something. I, I personally think it was about as fine a class that I have ever been in, period, anywhere, anytime. Uh, and if you were here, I think you probably would be in agreement with me. If you weren't, we do uh, make CDs, and they made one last Wednesday night. If you didn't hear Joe's message last Wednesday night, I would, uh, I'd go back in the back. Uh, you won't find any up on the shelf because they're all gone. But uh, if you'll let them know, they'll, uh, they'll make you a copy of it, and it will be well worth your time to listen to it. Uh, in fact, I intend to have one in the car and just pop it in, and I don't know how many times I'll listen to it, but uh, I know it'll be more than, more than once. The idea of, of falling in love with God, um, which is what, of course, we're all called to do. And I suppose the best scripture that we could turn to on that would be found in Matthew chapter 22, uh, beginning in, uh, in verse 34. And, and uh, I've asked Doug Davis to read scripture for me tonight, and then they'll also some of them be put on the screen, but I don't think I gave you that one, Doug. But this is where the lawyer or the attorney came to Jesus, and of course they were trying to catch him. And they asked him, what's the greatest of all the commandments? And of course they didn't really want to know what the greatest commandment was, but Jesus answered, and I'm satisfied that his answer was not what they were expecting to hear. He answered by saying, you're to love God with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your soul and all of your being. In essence, he's saying, love God with your entire self we are to give ourselves over to God and one of the things that Joe was trying to cover last week in order for us to really fall in love with God and to have that intimate relationship with him that he created us to have we've got to remove the bricks between us and him there are barriers there are barriers in our in, in our own lives and in our hearts and in our minds that prevent us from having the kind of relationship with, with God that we ought to have. Um, it's not until we're actually able to be totally, completely honest with God that we can ever have that intimate. Uh, and intimacy, Joe defined last week, as being into me see. In order to have that, these barriers have got to drop. Have you ever, have you ever been talking to God in, in prayer and talking about something and you didn't really lay everything out? You, there were things in your mind that related to that that somehow we just didn't tell God because we didn't want to admit to him. Do you understand what I'm asking? And isn't that rather ironical? We kind of grew up, those of us that are older, in an environment where you really didn't admit weaknesses because it was a sign of a weakness to admit the weakness. And we would put on a facade. We'd put on fronts. And it kept us from just telling God and, and opening ourselves up to it. And somehow, at some point, we've got to let that go. And, and what's, the, what's the ironical thing about that? Does God already know? See? See, it's something... We can hide things, I'm sure... Ms. Roberta has never hidden anything from Jimmy, ever, and Jimmy hasn't from her. But there are times when we talk to our mates and we, we tell the truth and we tell them how we're feeling, but we want to phrase it in such a way that it doesn't be, become offensive or that we don't reveal maybe the most innermost thoughts. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now, do we ever do that with God? Okay. 
somehow that brick has to be removed, that barrier that is there, because he already knows. And he just wants us to be open and, and honest and share it with him. And I wondered what uh, exactly where I would go tonight. And last when I think it was last Wednesday night, Joe gave me this book, and it might have even been two weeks ago. It's called The Path, and it's concerning Lent. Do you know what I'm referring to when I say Lent? It's, uh, I guess we, we basically associate Lent with uh, what religious group? The Catholics. But see, it's not just a, a Catholic thing, even though they might have been the ones to begin it. It's kind of like Sunday school. The Baptists are the ones that really kind of invented Sunday school, so to speak, as we know it and as it operates today. But it's something that we all can do. And it, today is a day that's referred to as what? Ash Wednesday. I didn't, I don't see any crosses or any foreheads in here. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have minded putting one on my forehead. I wouldn't, I probably didn't do it and didn't go find something just so that it wouldn't be conspicuous. But yet, if I were to see somebody today with a cross on their forehead from Lent, uh, I wouldn't think negatively toward them at all. I would think very positively. To indicate because it's the beginning. Now, Lent lasts for how many days? Forty days, and yet it ends on what day? Easter. Is it just 40 days to Easter? Forty-six. The reason that it's that far is because Sundays don't count. They're exceptions. So they have a Lent week, but it begins Monday through Saturday. And in this, uh, in this little booklet, there's a, uh, a day-by-day devotional, and there are scriptures, and there's thoughts. And, and you don't, by the way, you don't have to follow this. This is just one that happens to be put out by the Palm Valley Church out, uh, I've forgotten now exactly where it is. It's out in the Midwest somewhere. And as I looked at it, and I thought it looked pretty good, and I gave it to Carolyn. She looked over it, and we've decided uh, we're going to follow this. And we began this morning with reading the devotional from Luke 22, chapter 14, uh, verse 14, excuse me, and read the devotion, and then we prayed. But also in Lent, normally during Lent period, people do what? What also is trade is associated with Lent. Give up something. Now, in recent years, according to an article that I, I printed, and I'm going to share some of the thoughts from Chuck Colson, Charles Colson, or Chuck Colson from the Watergate days, that it, it's kind of, at times, become watered down. Okay, this is Lent. I'm going to give up chocolate. White chocolate may be all right, but I can still have my chocolate, but I won't be eating brown chocolate, you see. And I can, that way I can keep getting my sweets, and it, it's kind of watered down. But the whole idea and the purpose of is to give up something in order that what? Sacrifice. Give up something good for something that is better. You see, if we just give up food during Lent or whatever it is, if say you're going to give up sweets for 50 days or 46 days, 40 days plus Sunday, um, and if we focus on giving up the sweets, we've missed the point. The focus is to be on... This is a fill-in-the-blank question. The focus is to be on... <laughs> Nobody knows on God, on spiritual, on drawing us closer to the event of the crucifixion, which is the day that ends on Easter morning when his resurrection. And in, in this case, in the back of it, they even list some things uh, that you, you might want to continue to eat. There are things like vegetables and whole grains and fruits, seeds, liquids, things that might want to give up would be meat. 
white rice, fried foods, refined sugar, flour, dairy, caffeine, carbonated beverages. I thought I, I'm going to give up all of those things. But not caffeine. That surely can't be on the list. I mean, after all, and so you can design your own. What Carolyn and I have decided to do is to even on a week-to-week -week basis for the second week of Lent and the third week is we might change and give up something different, put something back in, design your own. But all of it in reality, I thought about, I thought about this, and that's actually what we're talking about in falling in love with God. You see, if, if by meeting with my wife each morning and praying and reading these scriptures and discussing these thoughts, and, and we have a prayer list, and we have some people on it that are going to be there for the entire 50 days, and there are others that may roll in and roll off. For example, our son from Florida called us and two people that they've been very close to in the six years they've been in Pensacola. One of them was, his wife said, really one of his very best friends. His wife yesterday died. She's in her early 50s. Now, they've been expecting it for a few weeks. And then another man who, who Rick was very close with, he played golf with, I think it was last week, he died. And he didn't have a suit to be buried in. And he happened to be the same size as our son. And so he was buried in, in one of his suits. Well, we want to pray at least this week for those families and for what they're going through. Do you understand what I'm saying? But see, the whole purpose of all of this is to bring us into a closer relationship with our Father God. You see... It's not about us, but it's about Him. And it's not about things, but it's about a relationship. And when we pray and when we talk to God, all too often our, our list is basically on things that are of immediate concern to us. And you see, that's okay. But the primary purpose of prayer is is to bring us into a closer relationship with our Father. That into me, see, that intimacy that we need to have with God. And if we're going to fall in love with the Lord, we've got to remove the bricks. We've got to become totally open. And we've got to just open ourselves up, as it were, to God. Now, I went on website, and I found with Chuck Colson and I'm going to give you the website address and if you want to write it down you can write it down now please understand something I'm not trying to suggest tonight that if you don't participate specifically in Lent and follow a, a regiment that is similar to the one that is here or another one that you would design that you're not as spiritual don't misunderstand me but I do know with all I believe this with all of my heart and I know that if you set aside a special time and if you're not in the custom of getting up a little early in the morning or of having a special time with God, I promise you, if you'll follow it for the next 46 days, it'll bring you closer to your Father. And this falling in love with God will occur as a natural result of what we're doing. It'll be a byproduct. This particular website is just three words, The Gospel Coalition. TheGospelCoalition.org You can go and then on there you can actually there's a little picture of one Why Bother with Lent you can click on it and you'll see this very information it's only three pages in here that'll give you and you can find other you, you can go to other sites other than this one and get information but in this one Chuck Colson mentioned there he says some five different benefits that he wanted to mention that we get when we follow Lent and put any put ourselves into it spend the time with Father and with God perhaps giving up something now I 
I, I'm hesitant about telling you what I might give up as far as food is concerned. It's just obvious by looking at me that, that I enjoy eating. It's something that I've struggled with my weight size ever for as far back, well, not as far back as I can remember, but going back to the time I got married. Right after I got married, all of a sudden it began to stick on me. But that, uh, what you choose, if you decide to do that, give up something that you'll reach for, that you'd want so that you can say no to yourself and that will remind you to talk to Father. That will remind you to do something that will draw you closer to God. This falling in love with Him, remove a barrier. That's the whole purpose of it and that's the intent. One of the benefits, he says, Lent affords us the opportunity to search the depth of our sin and experience the height of God's love. See, One of the things that we should do, obviously, is to acknowledge to Father. In fact, today's one of the things they had us to focus on in our devotion was to focus on, on our own selves. And one of the first things on the prayer list that Carolyn and I have, we're praying for each other. And we're praying for us to be purified and to be made holy and to be made cleansed. Turn to, if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to it or you can look at the screen. Look at uh, Psalms 139, verse 23 and verse 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Mm. Now that's the end of Psalm 139. Now the psalmist is crying out to God and saying, Lord, I want you to search me. But go back and look at the first three verses of this, very, of this psalm, this scripture, and see what the psalmist says in the very beginning. Lord, you have searched me and you know me. See? See? We said a few moments ago that it, it, did we sometimes are we sometimes less than totally honest with God because we don't want to admit to Father that we struggle with this. I, I don't want to tell God that I'm struggling with lusting. But Lord, just keep me pure. No, let's be specific. Why? Because God knows it already. And if we're ever going to really get close to Father, then we've got to acknowledge We've got to drop the bricks. And we just got to put it out there to him and say, Father, you know I struggle in this area. Please cleanse me and please purify me in my heart. Because when people look at me, I want them to see you. I want them to see Jesus Christ. He's asking him to search him, but he already knows God's searching him. Go ahead, Doug. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. See, God knows our thoughts. See, I can say something to my wife but she doesn't know what's in here. Now, a lot of times she guesses. A lot of times she thinks she does. And vice versa. But God knows. And if we're really, if we're really going to totally fall in love with him and have that intimate relationship, then we've got to quit playing games with God. Because he's already searched our heart. The psalmist tells at the very beginning he has searched him. And he knows him. And he knows his thoughts. He knows when he gets up. He knows when he goes to bed. He knows when he goes out. He knows when he comes in. And then at the end of the psalms he said, Lord, search me. Search me. Know me. I want to tie this into 
Psalm 51, verse 1 through 3. This Have is, mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Can you pray that prayer? Is there anything in your past that every now and then just pops back into your mind? Isn't that what David is saying? See, and God knows it. My sin, my transgression is always before me. We acknowledge it. Look at verse 9 and verse 10. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. You want to fall in love with God? Deeply in love? You want him to be deeply in love with you. How can we do it? Unless we ask him to blot out all of our iniquity and to create inside of us a pure heart. See? Not just a good heart, but pure. The thoughts. Not just what we do, but the motive behind what we do. And until we do that, we'll have difficulty falling deeply in love with God. And here's why. Look at verse 16 and 17. You do not delight in the sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. See? See, he doesn't want us to hide anything from him. And when we acknowledge to him, and we give him our broken selves, he delights in that. that's when he begins to see inside of us and we begin to have that intimacy and that intimate relationship with our father just close your eyes you talk to father in your own heart in your own mind and ask him to cleanse you. To purify you. Father, there's not a single one of us in this room tonight I don't need you to cleanse us and purify us. And the only reason we wouldn't need you is because we've already asked you and you've removed those things as far away from us as the east is from the west. God, I want a pure heart. I want to invite you to come in and look at me and search me in every way possible, knowing that you'll find the pure heart and therefore the desire to only do what you'd have me to do. And as we begin today, this period of time, those who choose to focus for the next 40 to 50 days, Lord, 
so that we can be drawn closer to you. Please remove anything that would just keep you from wanting to dwell inside of us. If I understand your scriptures correctly, the primary reason that you abandoned Jesus when he was dying on the cross was because he took our sins and you couldn't have anything to do with evil and so you had to separate. So God, I beg you to to take away every single one to cleanse and to purify so that you would want to dwell inside of me inside of each of us. You talk to your father. If you'd like to to pray out loud, I'd like for you to do so. of us and more of you until that time that we reach none of us but all of you. people in such a way that they can be an example to the rest of us. We thank you that your love permeates the hearts of some people around us. Mm -hmm. They can touch us and make us better. Father, I thank you for your family and that I'm a part of it a lowly part, but there are brothers and sisters higher and bigger who help me. Thank you, God. Thank you for their spirit. And all of God's children said, Amen. A second blessing and benefit from trying to focus on God as mentioned by, by Chuck Colson is that it affords us an opportunity to probe, the sin, to probe the sincerity of our discipleship. In Matthew 10 verse 38 and 39 you see sometimes I don't think we really I think we lose sight of what God's actually calling on us to do. Let's look at these verses and see if we need to cry out to the Father in these areas. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And let's look at Luke 9:23. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. When Jesus mentioned the word cross, they knew exactly what he was talking about. And he wasn't referring to a cross like we've got back here behind the baptistry. The word cross, they knew what it was. And they knew how horrible it was. And they knew the suffering that was involved. And yet Jesus said, unless you're willing to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me, you what? You cannot be my 
disciples. Can we all say that together? See, if, if we're going to fall in love with God and if we're going to get close with Him, He said, except you deny your and take up your and follow me daily. You cannot what? Folks, that's pretty convicting. Discipleship means I give up myself. Uh, let's look at John 16, verse 32 and verse 33. A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you'll have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. See, when we decided to follow Jesus... He expected us to take up a cross. I'm sorry? Roberta's asked, what does that mean to take up a cross? Who will help Roberta out? Hardship? Anybody? I didn't hear it. Suffering? Could be hardship? Could be suffering? Denial? denial? He specifically stated that, didn't he? What kind of denial? Self? When you offer yourself as a living sacrifice, you have taken up the cross. What else does that cross mean? Where's the microphone? You got one? Um, we take up a cross. They died on uh, it. On the crosses, people died. And uh, what so. Is that? Yeah, they got it now. And so, um, I guess to take up my cross means that I'm going to die to something. So I'll die to myself. I may have to die to my habits. I may have to die to companions. I may have to deny and to die to things that would lead me and take me away, my focus away from the Lord. And from Jesus, um, be willing to die to myself. And uh, okay, and if, if you've got a thought, share it. Honey, give the microphone right. I think she's going to have a thought. One of the things I have mentioned to you before, when our children were born, prior to their birth, when Carolyn was still carrying them, I started praying to God. I pray that you will let me live long enough so that I can help instill enough love in our children that if Terry were ever to be put to the test, you either deny Jesus or we're going to take your life, that she would choose to give up her life. Part of that, Roberta, is included in that statement. I think of that young girl in Columbine. You remember they walked in with a gun, and she was, what, 16, 17 years of age? And he pointed the gun at her and asked her about if she believed in Jesus, and she said yes, and boom, she went right into eternity. Now, I don't know if he would have spared her had she not answered it. But she definitely made her decision. You see, you and I have to make that decision in advance, or we may not make the right decision. Okay. Did you have something you wanted to uh, what number's on that mic? Three. Number three. 
Okay. I was just going to say that in that uh, scripture we just read, it said uh, that in this world we'll have trouble. And I think of taking up your cross as being denying the world and realizing that it's not about this world. It's about the one who died on the cross. And that's real hard to deny what we have here for something better. Did, did you all catch that? To deny here in order that we'll have something over here. And that's right. The present is never easy to deny as the future. Am I right? Okay. All right, any, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 8. Let's look at verse 18 and verse 22. Two people approaching Jesus. Let's look at those two. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me, let the dead bury their own dead. See, God calls us, and, and what, what I may have to give up, what's important to me may not be to you. But there may be, it may very well be something in your life, it might even cost you your job. It did Peter and James and John didn't it? they were fishermen and Jesus said you leave that and you come and I'll make you fishers of men on one occasion Jesus told a rich man that he had, had would have to do what he said go and sell what everything now let me ask you a question if he were to ask that of you, don't answer it, would you be willing to do it? Would God ask all of us to sell everything we have and give it away? There's the answer. Did all of you hear it? Why do you think he asked that rich man? Why do you think he told him, go sell everything you have and give it away? It was his God. See, I had someone ask me one night when we mentioned this scripture in, in a small group, and they said, God doesn't require that of us. He might. He might. If that means and is between us and him, he, that's exactly what he'd tell us to do. Because in Luke chapter 10, he said that we are to love him more than we love whom? Father, mother, brother, sister, son, or daughter, and all. He wants to be first. Now see, I, I, there's a young man right here that works me. Right now he's back here in the teen room. And when he became a Christian, his grandfather disowned him. His mother and father don't go to church. Now, they're not practicing Buddhist, but granddad is. And he was disowned. Jesus said, whatever it is, even if you're disowned by your parents or by your family, you have to love me more. You see, we have to be willing to drop down and take the bricks down. We have to be willing to say to the Lord, whatever you ask, whatever the cost, I'm going to follow you period if we're ever going to have that intimacy with our Father in Heaven. Well then, stand up then.
it is scary. It, it really is scary. Uh, and fortunately, see, for most of us, that's not required. But to him, it was required. And he said, I'm willing to give it. Now, this one other point, and then we'll, we'll close. This opportunity of trying to draw closer to God or Lent provides us with an opportunity to reflect on our own mortality. Uh, Hebrews 9.27, let's look at that scripture and then... Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. And then Revelation 21, 1 to 5, and then we'll, we'll close. Oh, did I not have that one? Okay. Revelation chapter 21. Have you got it, Doug? I'll take, take a minute. Is Revelation in the New Testament? Yes, or the it, it, <laughs> it is, but it barely is. Oh, it's on the board now. There you go. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice, from the throne saying look God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God he will wipe every tear from their eyes there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Okay. You know, the one thing that, that we just have got to understand, and this is one of the, this is the reason why we need to fall in love with God. And that's because of our mortality. It doesn't, doesn't matter. I realize that I'm older than most in here. I'm not nearly as old as my Zella, but I'm, I'm older than most of you that are in here. Well, maybe I am. I'm pa <laughs> uh, But it doesn't matter. One day, you see, my dad lived to be 89. My mother is 95, will be 96 in May, and she's still living. It doesn't matter. It's not very long. And one day we die. Then what? It's judgment. Then the only thing that will matter will be the relationship that I have with my father. Now, in the death, I, I mentioned the, the lady. She's in her early 50s, and she died yesterday down in Pensacola where our son is. The children came in. They had a, a short time to get ready for it. I remember when my brother, when they discovered at 57 that he had cancer. He had a group over to his house the night before he was going to have his surgery. And they just had a praise worship service. And they praised God. Three years later, he got hepatitis A, which is the mildest form of hepatitis. But he had lost his spleen, and it was unable in the cancer surgery, and it was unable the body was unable to fight it off. And we prayed hard for God to save him. And I remember he told his wife and his children he was so miserable. He was just in, he was in a hospital in Abilene, and they were going to put him in an ambulance and carry him to Baylor Hospital. The head of the liver transplant was his, going to be his doctor there, and he said, I don't want to go to Dallas. I'm ready to go. My brother really taught me about faith and about assurance. He knew. He knew where he was going to be. His wife and children, three children, looked at him and they said, but Daddy or Honey, we're not ready to give you up yet. 
will you please fight for us? And he did. But two weeks later, they unplugged him and he passed on. In the last four hours of his life, we stood around his bed and we were just singing hymns. It was truly a paradox, the best and the worst of times. But you see, he knew in whom he believed. He knew the mortality of life and the assurance of death. And that's why we need to fall in love with God. Oh, Father, please draw us to you. And when we are tempted by the evil one, please, Father, place in us a desire to just resist and to yield to you. And then one day, just receive us to be with you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Okay. You're dismissed.